In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. May His grace and His blessing be with us now and unto the age of all ages, Amen. I welcome all of you once again to our weekly Orthodox Bible study. This is our 54th week studying the book of Genesis and our ninth week on the character of Jacob, the third of the three great patriarchs of the Old Covenant. Let's begin reading Genesis chapter 32. And Jacob departed for his journey, and having looked up, he saw the host of God encamped, and the angels of God met him. And Jacob said when he saw them, This is the camp of God, and he called the name of that place Encampments. In this passage, which begins Genesis 32, Jacob leaves the place where Laban confronted him and comes to this place that is later known in Hebrew as Mehenaim, which means double camp. Here in the Septuagint, which we read, it's called encampments, plural. We don't know exactly where this place is today, but we're fairly certain it's in modern-day Jordan. It's not immediately clear why he calls the place double camp, but we do know from Jacob's words that he sees this place as God's camp. So perhaps the name reflects the fact that it's God's camp because of the angels he saw there, but it's also his camp because he remained there with his family. Also, as we're going to see, Jacob divides his camp into two as he prepares to meet Esau, and that could have some bearing on the name of this place as well. Now, we notice in this passage that the angels of God met Jacob. According to St. Ephraim the Syrian, there is significance in the appearance of these angels. When Jacob was going down from Canaan to Haran to find a wife, he saw the angels of God in his vision of the latter. And now as he's going back up from Haran to Canaan, he sees the angels of God again. For St. Ephraim, this is the fulfillment of what God said to Jacob back in Genesis 28, Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. God makes the same promise to Jacob later in Genesis 46 when he says, I will go down with you to Egypt and I will also surely bring you up again. This detail about the angels of God appearing served to show us the consistency of God's love and care for Jacob throughout his life. According to St. John Chrysostomos and other fathers, the angels of God also appear to strengthen and encourage Jacob in his upcoming meeting with his brother Esau, which we'll read about shortly. Once Jacob stopped fearing Laban after they made a covenant, his heart became filled with fear over meeting Esau, the brother from whom he took the firstborn's blessing through deception earlier in Genesis. In his love, God allowed Jacob to see the camp of the angels as an encouragement. And interestingly, this very same place would be used by David as a refuge from Absalom hundreds of years later. Just as it comforted Jacob before meeting Esau, it comforted David as he escaped from Absalom. It's interesting to see how these places appear in several significant events throughout the Holy Scriptures. And so we see the role of angels here in comforting Jacob, which is actually one of the functions of the angels in the Holy Scriptures. We remember that angels appear to our Lord Jesus Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane on the night before his crucifixion. Let's continue reading together. And Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, to the land of Seir, to the country of Edom. And he charged them, saying, Thus shall ye say to my lord Esau, Thus saith thy servant Jacob, I have sojourned with Laban and tarried until now. And there was born to me oxen and asses and sheep and men servants and women servants. And I sent to tell my lord Esau that thy servant might find grace in thy sight. In this passage, we as readers become reacquainted with the memory of Esau, Jacob's brother, whom he has not seen for twenty years. Did you notice the name of the place and country where Esau is residing? I spoke about these two names and their significance. You may be interested to know that there is a very interesting wordplay going on with Esau's name that associates him with Edom. As we mentioned earlier, Esau is a ruddy man, a red and wild. He demands the red lentil stew from Jacob, Ha Adama. 
And then you have the word Edom being very similar to the Hebrew word for rend. And not only that, but the Hebrew word for hairy sounds like ser, which happens to be the name of the place where all of the Edomites settle. So there's definitely some hidden wordplay in these Hebrew names that drives home the message that Esau is Edom, that the one is associated with the other. Now, since Jacob left 20 years earlier, Esau has settled with his family in the land of Edom, which was a dry land and an inhospitable place. The prophet Malachi spoke the word of God about this land of Esau in the following way. But I hated Esau, and I made his mountains an annihilation, and his heritage gifts of the wilderness. This accurately reflects where Esau ended up after Jacob left Canaan. Now going back to Jacob, we see in his actions the great fear he had in meeting Esau. He was afraid of his brother's violence because of what happened between them in the past. According to St. John Chrysostomus, this is why he sends messengers to Esau before he himself goes. He wants to give Esau a report of where he had spent all of his time and the great wealth he amassed so that Esau would receive him graciously. According to St. John Chrysostomus, God himself settles Esau's heart and calmed his anger just as God previously intervened and calmed Laban down. Let's continue reading. And the messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We came to thy brother Esau, and lo, he comes to meet thee, and four hundred men with him. And Jacob was greatly terrified, and was perplexed, and he divided the people that was with him, and the cows, and the camels, and the sheep, into two camps. And Jacob said, If Esau should come to one camp and smite him, the other camp shall be in safety. And Jacob said, God of my father Abram, and God of my father Isaac, O Lord, thou art he that said to me, Depart quickly to the land of thy birth, and I will do thee good. Let there be to me a sufficiency of all the justice and all the truth which thou hast wrought with thy servant. For with this my staff I passed over this Jordan, and now I am become two camps. Deliver me from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I am afraid of him, lest haply he should come and smite me and the mother upon the children. But thou saidst, I will do thee good, and will make thy seed as the sand of the sea, which shall not be numbered for multitude. In this passage, Jacob's messengers return and tell him that Esau is coming to meet him with four hundred armed men. Jacob becomes greatly afraid and distressed, which is perhaps exactly what Esau wanted in light of their previous meeting. In response, Jacob does two things. First, he takes the practical step in dividing his family and his possessions into two camps. The idea is that if Esau comes and attacks one, the other will have a chance of escaping. Second, and most importantly, he prays in verses 9 through 12. According to St. John Chrysostomus, Jacob's fear at meeting Esau served to help him place his life, his destiny, and his hope in God, who promised to always be with him earlier in Genesis. I want to reread Jacob's prayer and meditate on it with you, even though it's kind of a long prayer, but I think this exercise will be worth it. Let's read it together. And Jacob said, God of my father Abram, and God of my father Isaac, O Lord, thou art he that said to me, Depart quickly to the land of thy birth, and I will do thee good. Let there be to me a sufficiency of all the justice and all the truth which thou hast wrought with thy servant, for with this my staff I passed over this Jordan, and now I am become two camps. Deliver me from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I am afraid of him, lest haply he should come and smite me, and the mother upon the children. But thou saidst, I will do thee good, and will make thy seed as the sand of the sea, which shall not be numbered for the multitude. If we meditate on this prayer, we will see that this is the most humble prayer Jacob has offered so far. In this prayer, we begin to see the essence and purpose of Jacob's journey 
he is not only journeying from place to place to find a wife, to meet Esau, and to accomplish other things according to God's will. No, he is journeying himself to find God. This entire story is about the development of Jacob's relationship with God. When we compare this prayer of Jacob to his earlier prayer to God, we see a significant development. Another point for us to consider which may not be readily apparent is the detail in Jacob's prayer that he crossed over the Jordan River with only his staff. We can find this in verse 10. Jacob crossing the Jordan with his staff is a symbol of our Lord Jesus Christ and his cross. When Jacob crossed the Jordan with his staff, he was seeking deliverance from the hands of his enemies in the hands of God. And in the same way, when our Lord Jesus Christ was crucified, he delivered us from the hands of our enemies, which are sin and the fruit of sin, which is death. Thus, the holy wood of the cross is prefigured by Jacob's staff. The father saw other symbols in Jacob's staff as well. We know, for example, that he traveled from Canaan, the promised land, with nothing except his staff. And this mirrors how our Lord Jesus Christ came down from heaven and was incarnate with no place to receive him. He was born in a cave and traveled from place to place, just as Jacob laid his head on a stone in Bethel. With just his staff, Jacob took Rachel as a wife, just as our Lord Jesus Christ acquired the church to himself with his cross. We see clearly here how Jacob is a type of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's continue reading. And he slept there that night and took of the gifts which he carried with him, and sent out to Esau his brother two hundred she-goats, twenty he-goats, two hundred sheep, twenty rams, milch camels, and their foals, thirty, forty kine, ten bulls, twenty asses, and ten colts. And he gave them to his servants, each drove apart. And he said to his servants, Go on before me, and put a space between drove and drove. And he charged the first, saying, If Esau my brother meet thee, and he asked thee, saying, Whose art thou, and whither wouldest thou go, and whose are these possessions advancing before thee, thou shalt say, Thy servant Jacob's, he hath sent gifts to my lord Esau, and lo, he is behind us. And he charged the first, and the second, and the third, and all that went before him after these flocks, saying, Thus shall ye speak to Esau when ye find him, and ye shall say, Behold, thy servant Jacob comes after us. For he said, I will propitiate his countenance with the gifts going before his presence, and afterwards I will behold his face, for peradventure he will accept me. So the presence went on before him, but he himself lodged that night in the camp. In this lengthy passage, Jacob prepares gifts for his brother Esau and carefully instructs his servants as to how they should be presented. Jacob tells his servants to take the gifts to Esau in droves with distance between them. The end result is that Esau will see all of these different servants coming to him one after another with gifts rather than all at once. This was Jacob's intention, for he wanted to impress Esau. After all, Jacob knows Esau has 400 armed men, but Esau has no idea how many men Jacob has. So in this psychological war between them, each one tries to get the number or tries to get the upper hand uh, by the number of men with them or the number of gifts going before them. And this is all very clear in just the sheer number of gifts Jacob gives to Esau. When all is said and done, he gives Esau 580 animals alone, not counting any other gifts. Clearly, he is sending a message to his brother. Let's continue reading and see what happens next. And he arose up in that night, and he took his two wives and his two servant maids and his eleven children and crossed over the ford of Jabbok. And he took them and passed over the torrent and brought over all his possessions. So in this passage, Jacob takes his two wives, two maids, and his then eleven children, 
and crosses the ford of Jabuk along with his possessions. Now, for those that don't know, a ford is a stream that connects to a river where people can pass over. And as you probably expected, there is a significance to the name Jabuk. In Hebrew, the word Jabuk is Yabuk, whereas the word for wrestled is Yabik. Several scholars have noted that the Hebrew text of this passage suggests a word plane. Jacob, uh, which in Hebrew is Yakum, uh, wrestled um, Yabik at the Jabuk, Yabuk. And so this uh, place could very well have been named after the event that took place there, which was Jacob wrestling all night with God. And as we're going to see in a few verses, Jacob ultimately changes its name to Peniel, which literally means the face of God. This name change comes only after Jacob spends the night wrestling with God in this place. Let's continue reading. And Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till the morning, and he saw that he prevailed not against him. And he touched the broad part of his thigh, and the broad part of Jacob's thigh was benumbed, or paralyzed, in his wrestling with him. And he said to him, Let me go, for the day has dawned. But he said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. And he said to him, What is thy name? And he answered, Jacob. And he said to him, Thy name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel shall be thy name, for thou hast prevailed with God, and shalt be mighty with men. And Jacob asked and said, Tell me thy name. And he said, Wherefore dost thou ask after my name? And he blessed him there. In this passage, we have the famous and deeply mystical scene of Jacob wrestling with a man. The consensus among the fathers is that this man was a manifestation of the Logos, the second person of the Holy Trinity, our Lord Jesus Christ. We notice that Jacob wrestled with this man until the daybreak. According to St. Cyril of Alexandria, the struggle lasted until daybreak when the light shone upon the earth because there is no reason for us to struggle as long as we have the light. He goes on to say, When the light of justice, that is Christ, rises in our mind and introduces his brilliance into our hearts, then we also will be waited on as noble souls and will be made worthy of the divine attention. The eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. At daybreak, the fight ceases. The early Christian writer, St. Caesarius of Arle, he takes his symbolism further. He teaches us that Jacob wrestling with God symbolizes how the Jewish people wrestled with Christ and persecuted him. Just as the man did not prevail over Jacob, Christ did not prevail over the Jews, but rather permitted them to put him to death on the cross. And all of this happened until the daybreak, which is a symbol of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, which occurred at daybreak. The fact that Jacob does not let the man go until he blesses him symbolizes those Jews who held on to Christ and believed in him. Now Jacob's encounter with God would forever change him. First, if we were to read the Hebrew text of verses 17 through 31, we would see that the word for face is used no fewer than six times. In the Septuagint, for example, Jacob says the following as he instructs his servants to carry the gifts to Esau. I will propitiate his countenance with the gifts going before his presence, and afterwards I will behold his face, for peradventure he will accept me. And later, as I told you, Jacob changes the name of the place from Jabuk to Peniel, which means the face of God. We know that he does this on his way to face Esau. And these constant references to face remind us that up until this time in Jacob's life, he has been fleeing. He fled from Canaan. He fled from Haran. He fled from Esau. He fled from Laban. 
And at this point in his journey, Jacob is no longer fleeing, but instead he is facing all of the challenges in his life. Earlier he faced Laban, now he is about to face Esau, but before he can face Esau, he first has to face God, which is what all of this wrestling uh, is about. Now, according uh, to St. Ambrose of Milan, uh, when Jacob uh, purified his heart um, and he manifested a peaceful and humble disposition, as we saw in his earlier prayer, he remained alone um, and wrestled with God. And this is a lesson for us that we must forsake the things uh, of this world so that we can approach God. Secondly, as we saw in the slides, everything changes with Jacob as a result of his encounter with God. The first change is that his name becomes Israel, which mirrors what happens to or what happened to his grandparents earlier in Genesis. The word Israel literally means God strives. And again, this name comes as a parallel to what happens in the text. God tells Jacob, thy name shall no longer uh, be Jacob, but Israel shall be thy name, for thou hast struggled or prevailed with God and shalt be mighty with men. According to St. John Chrysostomus, Israel means seeing God, which reflects the fact that Jacob saw God as much as any human being could see God. In explaining this name, remember how God told Jacob, for thou hast struggled or prevailed with God and shalt be mighty with men. According to St. John Chrysostomus, Jacob will no longer have any fear or expect to suffer harm from anyone. Since he wrestled with God and prevailed, he will prevail over human beings as well. The second change Jacob undergoes is an internal change, which we see from his later words. I remind you that earlier in Genesis 31 and elsewhere, Jacob refers to God as the God of my fathers or the fear of Isaac. After this encounter with God, however, he addresses God as the God of Israel. And so the story is very much the story of Jacob's own journey in his relationship with God. Recall that in Genesis 28, Jacob made a vow to God. We read, And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If the Lord God will be with me and guard me throughout on this journey on which I am going, and give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, and bring me back in safety to the house of my father, then shall the Lord be for a God to me. This was the vow Jacob made. But when you look at his actions and interaction with God until this wrestling scene, you will clearly see that Jacob hasn't really fulfilled his promise. Although Jacob obeys God, there is a certain distance between him and God in his actions. When Jacob becomes greatly afraid at the prospect of meeting Esau, his prayer grows more humble. But as you can see, still from Genesis 32 verse 9, he still addresses God with some distance. He says, God of my father Abram and God of my father Isaac, O Lord, thou art he that said to me, Depart quickly to the land of thy birth, and I will do thee good. After he wrestles with God, all of this changes. He becomes Israel and takes God as his God, the God of Israel. The third and the final change that Israel undergoes, or Jacob undergoes as a result of this encounter with God, is a physical change. He must now walk with a limp for the rest of his life. No one can see God and come away from it unscathed. And there is a certain irony in the fact that Israel will be tripped up by a limp for the rest of his life because he began his life by tripping Esau as he exited their mother's womb first. Let's continue reading. And Jacob called the name of that place Peniel, the face of God, for, said he, I have seen God face to face, 
and my life was preserved, and the sun rose upon him when he passed the face of God, and he halted upon his thigh. In this passage, we see Jacob, or Israel now, calling the place Peniel, which means face of God, as we mentioned earlier. Again, notice how the name comes from the context. Jacob names it thus and explains, For I have seen God face to face, and my life was preserved. Although it sounds like these two things are not related, the verse does give one the sense that because Jacob saw the face of God, his life was preserved. The one leads to the other. And this concept is very important for our understanding of the history of salvation because we all receive salvation through the life-giving work of our Lord Jesus Christ who became one of us and allowed us to see him. He became what he is not so that we could become what he is. St. John Chrysostomus teaches us that all of the apparitions and visions of Christ in the Old Testament serve to remind us of this fact. When Abraham was sitting by the oak of Mamre, God came in human form along with two angels to prefigure his coming in the flesh to free us from the tyranny of sin and the fruit of sin which is death. In the same way, he wrestled with Jacob to prefigure his coming in the flesh to save us. God acknowledges all of this through the mouth of Hosea the prophet who said, And I will speak to the prophets, and I have multiplied visions, and by the means of the prophets I was represented. Thus, throughout history, God has revealed himself to us at various times and in various ways to prefigure his ultimate coming in the flesh when he saved us from sin and death. Let's continue reading. Therefore the children of Israel will by no means eat of the sinew which was benumbed, or paralyzed, which is on the broad part of the thigh until this day, because the angel touched the broad part of the thigh of Jacob, even the sinew which was benumbed, or paralyzed. So here in this passage we are told that the Israelites do not eat of the muscle of the hip socket in remembrance of what transpired between God and Israel. There are some differences in translations between thigh and hip, muscle and sinew, but the point to remember is that God touched the area of Jacob's hip or thigh and the nerves became numb so that Israel limped for the rest of his life. St. Ambrose of Milan offered a beautiful meditation on this. Israel, of course, would eventually be the father of the Jews and also of the Christians. St. Ambrose said that his good hip represented the faith of the Christians who believed and were able to move forward. The bad hip, however, represented the unbelief of the Jews who were lame in their lack of faith. According to St. John Chrysostomus, the fact that the Israelites do not eat of this muscle is a reminder to them about the love and compassion of God in what he did with Jacob. In our next Orthodox Bible study, we will discover what transpires at the meeting between the newly changed Jacob, or Israel, and his brother Esau. And glory be to God forever. Amen.